All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 27. This is a weekly JavaScript podcast bringing you all the best news from this week. And uh, yeah, we got, well, surprisingly, not that much stuff this week around. I don't know why, but uh, there you go. Uh, hello, Baka. Welcome to the stream. Hello, White. Um, let me try to read your username. White I I don't know how to read that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nice hair. Thank you. Nice haircut indeed. I got very lazy about my long hair and just went and, you know, did this basically. It's very convenient. <laughs> okay. Um, let us get back to the news, shall we? So the first article we got today is uh, from zero to hero with Vue up and running. This is a very detailed tutorial about Vue.js and uh, yeah, basically everything that you need to know to get started. So I um, like I won't go through the article itself because it's very simple, right? It's a very basic tutorial. The question I have for you guys is actually is articles like this uh, actually interesting for you? Is this something you want to see on this podcast? Is like, should there be more tutorials, like basic tutorials, less of them? Because, uh, you know, on one hand, I think that this is a good article. And yes, it's, it's a very basic one, but it does give you everything you need to know to start working with you. On the other hand, I don't know, maybe majority of you guys watching this are far beyond the point of needing articles like this. So maybe we can just skip them. Do let me know in the chat, in the comments, in Discord or wherever the hell you like. I would be very interested to hear your opinion on that. All right, continuing, we got uh, TypeScript at Google. Really cool article with insights from the one of the engineers working at Google on how the JavaScript works within Google and uh, how does the teams who actually been working on the web apps for past, I don't know, 20, no, I guess it's not 20, 14 years. Uh, so the Gmail was released 14 years ago, how they evolved the code base, how they changed the tooling and how much, you know, friction was there to actually try and change something within a huge and old projects like Gmail. Hey, Strax, welcome to the stream. Uh, really cool article if you are interested in learning about in depth more about you know what kind of stuff uh how does it work within a large teams i guess and large companies like google and how do they adopt new technologies like typescript and why they pick typescript and all of that kind of stuff it's not extremely large article but there's a lot of very interesting points in here so if you are not only interested in development, but also interested in, you know, like, I guess, organizational and business aspects, do have a look. There is some very cool points in here. I'm for keeping news broad, even for beginners. Got it. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Um, everyone is jumping the JavaScript train. It is good to give them some roadmap. Uh, that's a fair point. I mean, that, that was my original thought as well. So um, I am with you on this, but I just wanted, you know, to have some sort of a feedback from the actual viewers, not just like come up with a decision myself, basically. <laughs> okay, but uh, thank you very much for giving the feedback. All right, let us get back to the news. So the next article we got today is called Building a Polyfill for React Suspense. Um, exactly what the title says. So as you know, the React Suspense is the upcoming API for React that will um, basically allow you to easier create the uh, synchronous components that load the data in the background, right? We already had those really fancy demos and uh, we looked at the source code that did it and there's the Suspense slides and stuff like this, like all of that stuff is, is very nice and fancy, right? But, um, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to understand how exactly it works under the hood if you just, you know, especially if you try to look at the React code base because there's not just React Suspense, there's like 200 more different classes and tools and things and it might be just hard to figure it out. So this article says, okay, let's try to understand how Suspense work uh, by building a polyfill for it. As in, you know, we, we work with what we have right now and build a specific React Suspense component uh, React Suspense components, because there's more than one, specifically React Placeholder and React Timeout, and uh, ship it for the current version of React. 
So if you are interested in knowing all the nitty gritty of React Suspense and want to know how exactly it works and how to implement it yourself, or maybe you just want to use it right now, because I mean, it is a really cool approach to doing things. Do check out this article. It does explain everything quite well. All right, continuing, we got understanding Expo for React Native, a quick guide on what it does and why it's so popular. Essentially, if you um, never worked with React Native and you have never heard about Expo, the Expo is an app that you can install on your phone uh, or locally or, you know, there's like, a, or yeah, on emulator or whatever. So it's an app that essentially allows you to deploy your React Native app within that app without having to build your own binary and, you know, making it basically 10 times simpler to do prototyping and testing, right? So for example, uh, you can just install Expo on uh, iOS and then you wouldn't need to acquire iOS development license to test your apps on the phone itself, right? Which is kind of nice. And um, yeah, so basically the article goes into explanation of how exactly Expo works. Uh, there's, you know, dev server involved and everything is pretty straightforward if you ever did a web dev with like a hot reload server and stuff like this. Uh, it explains how to distribute apps with Expo and uh, how do you update apps and what are the shortcomings. So the primary shortcoming of Expo, and this is like the thing that you probably will have to keep in mind all of the time, is that Expo does not work with um, native libraries, right? So as long as soon as your library says, okay, you have to do React Native Link or you have to, you know, edit the Android manifest or Xcode project, you cannot use Expo. You will have to eject, you will have to, you know, change your project and only then you will be able to use native app. So if it's just for prototyping UIs and, you know, figuring out how the project should work and a very high level stuff, Expo works amazingly well, especially when you can, you know, distribute the same app to the whole team and then get like a feedback within hours. Um, as soon as you start building your actual project, well, I would not actually use it. I would switch to proper native app and, uh, you know, eject it and do all that kind of stuff. But yes, this is a good introduction to what Expo is, how it works, and when you should use it and when you should not use it. Do have a look if that sounds interesting. Right, next article we got is uh, how we got to 100% Lighthouse performance score with our Vue.js app. So this is a primer on uh, the optimization of a Vue.js based app that went from abysmal 34 uh, of out of 100 uh, Lighthouse score to the 100 out of 100, right? So, and it basically is step-by-step -step explanation of what they did to achieve that, how they did it, and uh, what was exactly the problem, right? So I think Lighthouse itself is an amazing tool. I mean, again, you know, if you open the inspect console and you go to the audits, the Lighthouse audit is just really cool. I mean, it's integrated in the browser now. So if, if you ever ship anything to the web, use the Lighthouse to audit your app. Because even if you don't get the 100 score, it will give you a lot of tips that will help you make your app a lot better. Even, you know, even if you don't achieve the complete 100 score, which is, I mean, it's not that hard, but uh, can be a bit tricky, let's put it this way. But yeah, so they uh yeah the article talks about using stuff like webpack bundle analyzer to reduce the bundle size remove remove the unneeded um dependencies then do the tree shaking on some dependencies like yeah i think one of the most common things is using the complete lodash library when you actually need like one method from it so luckily for us lodash supports tree shaking very well right now so you can literally just import one method and uh, be done with it. And there's like a bunch of plugins for Webpack and Babel and whatever that do that for you essentially. Uh, so yeah, uh, then there is code splitting, which is obviously something that you should set up if you still don't have it. Uh, then again, if you use Next.js and stuff like this, it's already baked in, which is very nice. And then there's, yeah, I guess this is basically most of the stuff they did because this does eliminate 90% of your issues actually with uh, web app loading and uh, sizes, you know. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in getting more details, there is a bit more insights than I um, out. Uh, let me try that again. There's a bit more details than I have outlined here. So do have a look at the article. It has some pretty interesting stuff in there. Okay, continuing, we got wormholes in JavaScript. Um, 
So the author uses the wormhole um, as a, I, I actually find this a, to be a really cool uh, term for this. So wait a second, let me try to find, um, let me try to find uh, the, 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 the definition he gives it. Okay, if we know what the computer is really fast at, we can take shortcuts or wormholes to make our programs run much faster than we'd expect them to. So the idea is that you can use different uh, expressions to make your code run faster because you know how the engine works, right? And in this case, there's a bunch of examples, like for example, the modulus wormhole, right? So that instead of using the uh, index in array, you can use index modulus, which would be uh, like, which would take actually way less time due to the way that the integers are calculated within the engine, right? So the, because of the uh, binary representation and all that kind of stuff. So um, like the thing is that this is a really cool topic and every time I see code like this, I am absolutely fascinated. You know, that's like when you read the explanation, okay, this is really easy and I understand how it works and this is really cool. But once I see the code like this, it is, it takes me ages to understand what the hell is happening in here, especially like the, there's this end operand and there's the, okay, I guess the uh, modulus is not that hard to understand, but like all the bitwise stuff and, you know, all the bit shifts and bitwise comparison and all of that kind of stuff. It is just like another world for me, I guess because I don't really use it that much and I never had to optimize my code so much. Uh, I mean, you can, yeah, you can like gain like five to 10 X speed ups from using that stuff, but I guess I just never had to use that. But uh, nonetheless, if you are interested in uh, reading about wormholes with some really good examples and the topic sounds very interesting to you, do have a look at the article. It's really good and explains really well what's happening and also has, references to some additional worm, wormholes. I think this, this is how I'm gonna call them now because it's gonna be everything is gonna be a wormhole list, whatever. The tiny uh, bitwise operations are not gonna be wormholes. Um, I mean, sometimes, yes, sometimes readability is better than performance, but depending on the use case and application, you will have those moments where you have to sacrifice readability for performance, right? So you will have to optimize some very specific bits of code that will have to hit that specific like millisecond target or whatever. In most of the cases, it's actually easier to just take a native language, like, you know, the low level, blah, low level language like C++ or Golang or whatever and rewrite that bit in it. And if you still need it, to click um, to invoke it in, in Node.js, you would just use a, you know, build it as a native library and use it from uh, Node.js. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like, I don't know how, um, unless you're running in a browser, right? Because then you cannot really do that uh, unless we're talking WebAssembly, which is still not quite there, but uh, it's a tricky question basically. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, this is a, there's a definitive answer that, hey, readability is definitely better than performance. Not always. And sometimes, yes, sometimes readability is better, but other times you have no choice. Okay, let us continue. The next article we got is learning where you are looking at in the browser. Uh, another TensorFlow.js tutorial that basically recreates uh, eye tracking uh, using convolutional neural networks to determine specific coordinates on the screen where your eyes are looking at, which is, I think, a really cool use case for it, actually. So essentially, you um, start from scratch, you first detect the face, you crop up the eyes uh, from the face, and then basically you collect the data for the uh, movements. So you have to train your model to basically tell it, hey, you know, if I'm looking here, I'm looking at this area. If I'm looking here, I'm looking at this area and so on and so forth. Then you train the model and then you predict or try to predict, I guess, uh, what is happening. So yeah, it's, it's a really good tutorial complete with uh, model training and everything. Uh, so if you're interested in, again, learning uh, TensorFlow.js or maybe you want to use that technology for something, uh, I don't know, maybe you're building a website or a game or, you know, whatever, then check it out. It is quite good. Um, again, absolutely no server is necessary, which is quite nice. Okay, continuing, we got basic mod ads in JavaScript. Um, 
just as the title says, it's an introduction to a basic monads uh, in JavaScript. If you never heard a word monad that is a part of the functional programming as always, those guys always have tend to have the tr trickiest terminology ever. But fear not, the monads are actually quite a simple concept. So once you start reading this article, you will um, understand them immediately. So um, the article talks specifically about um, two monads, I believe there was a maybe monad, uh, there was either monad, and I think there was it or was there something? Yeah, there was two monads, maybe an either. And how do you apply them in practice, which is I think the best way to basically learn anything, at least, you know, for me. So uh, if you were interested in uh, getting a bit more functional programming into your code, and were interested in learning about monads, or maybe expanding your knowledge about monads, do check out this article, it will get you started quite nicely. All right, continuing, we got what and how to test with Jest and Enzyme, full instruction on React component testing. Again, a tutorial, starting from the very basics and going into um, relatively advanced topics uh, concerning Jest and Enzyme for React testing. It is very large, so as you can see on the screen, there is a lot of code, a lot of text, and a lot of explanations. It is quite detailed, so it goes through testing just about everything, including model wrappers, model windows, portals, and whatever the hell you can imagine. So if you are just getting into React testing, if you never use Jest and Enzyme, or maybe you just use Jest but then never heard about Enzyme, do check it out, it will get you started quite nicely. It will walk you through basically everything you wanna know about the testing React components, snapshot testing, um, enzyme testing, and yeah, basically, you know, everything you wanna know about re testing React components is in here. So that's don't really have much more to say, quite recommend it. Okay, next article we got is TypeScript with Babel, a beautiful marriage. So as we already talked on uh, last podcast, Babel 7 is out and now it supports TypeScript uh, as in, you know, natively, I guess you could say. So there's a Babel preset TypeScript that you can just plug in and uh, Babel will run TypeScript over it, which is really convenient and really nice. And maybe I even will start using TypeScript more. I don't know, maybe I should try probably. <laughs> but um, this article talks specifically about setting up Babel with TypeScript. Why does why is it a good thing? And how do you do that? And why you should use it more? So I, I mean, I personally use Babel at least through Next.js quite a lot because um, it's just convenient. Plus I really wanna use all the new fancy things like the um, opt um, optional chaining and um, Oh God, I forgot it. What was the pipeline operator and all that kind of stuff? Because this is just, you know, the awesome bits. I don't know which stage are they are right now, actually, but I still unconditionally love the optional uh, chaining. And uh, is it, which stage is it? They have a, they don't, they don't have, okay. They have a proposal link at least. Let's check it out. I would move, so it's still stage one. I guess there are some issues, but um, I mean, stage one is good enough for me. At least it's not stage zero, you know? <laughs> gonna be writing terrible code and pasting uh, free stage three um, features into my code and then suffering because they will be canceled. <laughs> okay, no, let's not do that. Uh, yeah, the author also talks that there is uh, additional Babel plugins that are basically really convenient like Babel plugin macros, for example, and a bunch of others that can be very helpful to you. Uh, the, another point is that it's easier to manage one compiler instead of two. So before Babel 7, that was, I think, my main complaint about TypeScript is that TypeScript does not really have all the features of uh, ES. I mean, I think now it actually has, but at the time it didn't have like, you know, the latest async await and some other things that I don't really remember. So basically what you had to do is you had to set up the uh, TypeScript compilation, or I think it was first the JavaScript compilation, right? You had to compile like a sync await and then you compiled TypeScript and then that had to be minified. And it was like a huge pain in ass to set up the whole pipeline. So um, yeah, that was one of the reasons I think I didn't really use TypeScript at the time because I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll just stick to my JavaScript. <laughs> 
But uh, now that's a non-problem essentially because Babel can do everything for you. So it will compile nicely the TypeScript itself. It will nicely compile all the features and everything. And uh, TypeScript configuration is also very simple right now. So there's no problems with that. Uh, and yeah, it's, it is now actually way faster than obviously running two different uh, compilators to just run Babel and uh, in the zone as you code, yeah, there's like a bunch of other points that you might read about Babel and TypeScript. So if you wanted to know why you should switch from using TypeScript separately from Babel to just using Babel, this article will give you quite a lot of pretty convincing points. And uh, there's also quite a lot of very cool links to a different Babel related and TypeScript related packages that you might want to use. So do check it out if you work either with Babel or with TypeScript and want to use the other one because there is quite a lot of knowledge in here. Quite recommend it. Okay, continuing. We got an article from uh, developers uh, at Google. So this is a Google web developers website and the article is called Inside Look at the Modern Web Browser. Uh, this is part one, but they are going to have part uh, four parts. Uh, there is two parts currently published, uh, two more coming up quite soon. And, uh, you know, as it typically comes from the web developers at Google, this is a very in-depth, very low level art. I mean, okay, not very low level. That's actually a lie. So uh, let me just read you the summary. And this four part blog series will look inside the Chrome browser from high level architecture to the specifics of the rendering pipeline. If you ever wondered how the browser turns your code into a functional website, or you aren't sure why a specific technique is suggested for performance improvements, this series is for you. So yeah, this is why I'm saying that it's not strictly low level because it actually covers all the levels and talks about, uh, you know, everything starting from CPU and GPU, like actually what is CPU and what is GPU and how are they used within the Chrome, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Going to the lowest level, you know, going to the browser architecture and going into the multi processes in Chrome and why they are good, why they were, uh, why they why exactly they switched to multi processes. I still remember the time when Chrome would crash if something went wrong in one of the tabs. That was just terrible. Um, yeah, then there's like saving memory, pre frame render processes, site isolation, and so on and so forth. This is just one part. So if this sounds interesting, if you are interested in all of the sort of nitty gritty of how the Chrome is made, how is it built, what's the architecture, how it interacts with other parts, including hardware, and uh, how does actually the whole you know process work? So the how does navigation ham happens and how does rendering happens and how does JavaScript works? What are the service workers? What is the navigational preload and stuff like this? This article will tell you everything you need to know about Chrome basically. And uh, I think it's written in a very simple language. So it's not, you know, I don't think you need to be um, particularly an expert in JavaScript or really anything to understand what the article talks about. So you do need a basic knowledge of what is the computer and how it works, right? And how the operational system works. Uh, but you know, since you're watching this podcast, I'm assuming you do have at least some knowledge of that. So you're probably gonna be good. Um, so if you want to know about Chrome, more about Chrome, or I guess more about modern browsers, because I'm guessing that Firefox and Edge and Safari are not that different from Chrome itself do check it out. This is as usual from um, Google web developers, a really, really good article or set of article. Okay. Continuing, we got a git pod online IDE for GitHub. So this is an announcement post actually, but I thought it was really cool. So, you know, I'll just throw it into the articles instead of releases because um, there's a bit more info than just, Hey, we released the thing. Here's a, here's a link to it. Right? So, yet another cloud IDE as they say uh, themselves, but it's an IDE that extends the GitHub essentially, right? So the cool thing is that they are claiming they want to be Visual Studio Code in the cloud, in your browser, right? Which gives you like a terminal and files and everything. It actually, it actually looks a lot like Visual Studio Code. I don't know if they forked it and modified or what, what just happened there, but 
it looks really great. And the cool thing is that you can literally open it by um, just doing this. There's a link, which is like HTTPS, gitpod.io. Then there's a hash and then there's a repository name. And uh, once you click that, you will be prompted with the authorization from the Gitpod. So they want my email, they want my public repos and read only access to my teams, which is fine. I think I will grant them the default stuff. So I need my password. Um, to be honest with you, I had no time to check it as you might imagine. So uh, yes, let me receive the updates. Why not? Let's, let's check. I, you know, that sounds really exciting. So I'm interested. Uh, I do not want to install Chrome extension. They also have a Chrome extension that basically you can use directly from the GitHub, uh, which seems pretty convenient. Imagine my uh, JavaScript is completely blocked here, so that's not gonna work. Let me allow that. Right, come on. Uh, okay, pulling Docker images. Where, where? I guess it's running in Docker. So I think think uh, they at least have a repo for the issues. I don't know if they have the, yeah, it doesn't seem like they published any source code and I don't know if they will, but it would be very interesting. Um, do they have, yeah, so it looks like at least there is no, okay, they have this Thea fork, which is a clouded desktop IDE which looks exactly like what they use basically. So at least they, they open source their IDE, but I guess maybe not the whole uh, infrastructure. So anyway, okay, there we go. So we got the nice welcome screen, uh, which I don't care about, but yeah. So it this literally looks like VS Code, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. And uh, service is available on port 3000. Uh, yeah, I guess open. Oh, it even has the integrated browser tab. That is very convenient. And it even auto starts the project for you. Holy crap, that is, that is impressive. That's just straight up impressive. And we got the next JS starter kit here and it just works out of the box and we can just edit it. And I imagine the everything is just like working as it expected h1 hello what no yes i know that it's going to be broken let me type hello world h1 yep stop stopping i'm <laughs> okay there are some bugs definitely but um it actually works including the um the hot reload and everything that is really impressive okay so yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It seems to be pretty cool. Uh, oh, they actually have the bit about open sourcing. So they open source the uh, Thea fork and that's basically it. So I will be interested to see how the backend works, but I don't know if they actually have any backend. That's, a, that's also a question. So it probably should investigate that. But anyway, it seems like a really cool project. It's gonna keep my eye on that. Let us continue, I guess. The next article we got is from GitHub engineering team. It's called removing jQuery from github.com. And it's essentially a story on how GitHub approached um, removing jQuery. So, you know, they, they had a dependency um, for quite some time, I think. And then they decided, okay, we no longer actually need it because the GitHub uh, front end is quite lightweight actually. And <clears throat> And they basically describe how exactly they approached the removal, uh, what was the, you know, the sort of metrics they used to track it and what kind of plugins and extensions and thing they used to sort of better control and figure out which, which bits are jQuery, which is not, so on and so forth. So, and what they used in, um, yeah, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, what have they used in exchange for jQuery, is that correct? Instead of jQuery, this is what I'm trying to say. What have they used instead of jQuery, which in this case, majority of time is custom elements, which is, yeah, I think like the time and stuff. And obviously they have a list of uh, links that they projects, I guess, uh, GitHub repos they use to replace jQuery itself, which is a bunch of libraries and uh, custom elements and uh, stuff like this. So. If this sounds interesting, maybe you are currently removing jQuery from the project yourself, or maybe you want to do it at work to check it out. This is a pretty good story and will give you quite a lot of good pointers on how to do that. Okay. Continuing, we got another article from uh, Google Web Developers. It's called Asynchronous Access to HTTP Cookies. 
and it basically introduces the async uh, API for a cookie store that is, um, I think, yeah, so it's uh, available in Chrome 69. I believe it's no longer actually behind the flag, which is quite nice. So um, it allows you to access the cookies asynchronously, which means they no longer will block the main thread. I have seen more than one app that was working with cookies and completely blocked rendering, which was horrendous. And um, it was kind of justified, but you know, still a bit of a pain in the ass. So now actually you can evade that quite easily because you just have the promise APIs and you can await cookie store, um, set cookie store get. You can also now observe cookies. So instead of polling and you know monitoring cookie for change yourself, you can just say, hey, cookie store out of that list or change and then, you know, monitor for the cookie name you want. And uh, why there is a disclaimer when they use cookies on the website, that is a European Union law. That is a bit silly. Um, um, like there is, I, I don't remember what's the cookie law. So there's a European Union law. Cookie law explained. Yes. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, privacy and electronic communication regulations. So the thing is that the law states that all the websites, I mean, that's that's how majority of people calls it. It's literally a cookie law. So it basically says that websites should uh, notify the user if anything is used to um, track him basically, right? So this was sort of pre GDPR thing that was like, hey, we are using cookies to track you, right? And it was a very how fast law and I don't think it actually worked at all because literally the only thing we got out of it was the cookie boxes, which is uh, not very good basically. GDPR is a way better attempt at trying to give the privacy and you know control over your data back to the users because instead of just saying, hey, we use cookies, you actually see the list of um, partners that get the cookies, right? And now you can see like 2 million advertisers who actually track you through their website, which is way better. But yeah, I think there's still like a long way to go there. So we're going to see how that develops. Okay. So another uh, improvement with the cookies is that uh, service workers can now access cookies using the cookie store API, which is kind of great. I believe uh, service worker were not able to access cookies at all before. Yes. Okay. P has not been available. So now you can actually access cookies from the service worker without any workarounds or anything. It's quite nice. And okay. I was wrong. It is actually still behind the flag. So you need to provide enable blink feature cookie store. So I guess it's still uh, sort of experimental, but I'm hoping it's going to be shipped in the next couple of versions to the production because that seems like a very nice feature. Okay. Continuing. We got the article, the practical guide for business, uh, what am I reading? Come on. The practical guide for building REST API in Node.js and MongoDB, including Passport and JSON Web Tokens. Again, this is a very entry level tutorial on building REST APIs with Node and Mongo, including, uh, as it said, Passport and uh, JSON Web Tokens. It is a very large tutorial and basically will explain everything you need to know about the. Um, I guess REST APIs, authentication, JSON web tokens, and MongoDB, because there's like a lot of very detailed information about all of those things. I think they use ExpressJS, if I remember correctly from the source code. So, you know, if you are getting started with Node.js, if you are just, you know, thinking on how, okay, how can I build the REST API? How do I approach this? How do I actually get to it? So this article is for you. Other than that, I don't really have much to say about it. It's a very starter level tutorial. So um, let's just continue. Okay, next thing we got is how to handle post request body in Node.js without using a framework. Um, so here's the thing. This is also a very basic tutorial that talks about handling post request body um, without using any third party packages. But the thing is, um, I find it to be way more important, I guess, to learn things like this instead of learning the packages, because this is essentially using the standard library, right? So this is you just use the integrated node modules, like in this case, HTTP, to handle and serve requests to capture the post data and to actually read it and 
do something with it. So it turns out a lot of people who actually work with libraries like Express, Fastify, I don't know, Happy, whatever, they don't really understand how it works under the hoods and that might end up in some problems, right? So some issues, some bugs, some limitations, some unexpected for them breakages. So I think if you if you work with, you know, Express or Fastify or whatever, and you don't understand how the um, body works, um, then it is quite highly recommended to read this article and uh, figure out how exactly it is handled on the lowest level, basically on, you know, the, the uh, standard library level of Node.js. So it is not very long. Again, it's like, you know, just a couple of pages. There is nothing extremely hard about it as well, but I think it's a great knowledge that you should be able to, at least that you should understand, let's put it this way. Stream is laggy for me. Why it's not YouTube streaming? There's no ability to pause or sync back. Um, sorry, I never tried YouTube streaming actually, to be honest, um, but I, I, I probably should investigate like multi-streaming or something. I typically stream on Twitch just because it's is the easiest way to, you know, set it up. I never tried the YouTube, but I am, um, I remember it had some issues for me, like at least, you know, three years ago when they just launched it, it was pain in ass, but I, I honestly don't know. I haven't tried it in years. Um, I will look into the multi-streaming services and we'll see how good they are. But uh, basically if you have any problems, feel free to just drop the stream and watch it on YouTube later. So I will definitely re-upload it to YouTube as, as usual. Uh, but yeah, I don't, like, I, don't, I don't know what to suggest here. <laughs> okay, let us continue with the news. Uh, the next article we got is a tour of JavaScript timers on a web. Um, yeah, essentially it's a very basic introduction to all available timers in JavaScript, including promises, set timeout, set interval, set immediate, request animation frame and request idle callback, including a bonus coverage of Lodash functions, debounce and throttle, which are actually not just Lodash functions, but you know, a general quite useful functions when you're working with timings. So if you are getting into the whole timers and you need to use, or you maybe you haven't heard about one of those functions like request animation frame or request idle callback, then this article will get you started quite nicely. If you know all those names and if you know what those functions do, then you won't really find anything new here. Right, continuing, we got using, uh, let me try that again. Using the speech synthesis uh, interface of the web speech API. This is a tutorial for web speech API that shows how to synthesize the voice uh, using JavaScript, which is uh, a thing I did not know you could do before reading this tutorial, to be honest. So this is quite neat. Uh, it is not extremely large, you know, it's actually quite simple. The API itself is also very nice and easy to use, but uh, and it also supports different languages, which is even insane when you think about it. But, you know, I guess it just taps into the OS API, which is probably how it works. But I'm guessing maybe the browser just shipped their own speech synthesis, which could be crazy, but uh, is not something I exclude. I probably should read more about how exactly it works under the hood. But anyway, this um, article essentially shows how to build a Japanese phrase book that reads you Japanese words uh, using the speech synthesis, which is pretty cool. So, you know, if you're interested in synthesizing speech from the web, do have a look. This article will get you started in about four minutes, as they say. There you go. Okay. Uh, next article we got is Goodbye Redux, a complete breakdown on why we needed Redux in the past and why we don't need it anymore. Totally disagree with this sentiment. I think we still need Redux and this is not something you can just replace because it's a tool that was built for a very specific thing and it still is best tool for that specific use case basically. But um, the article itself talks about that, hey, so there was the, you know, the JavaScript before and there was like the Facebook had the problem with the state management. So they built React and then they built the Redux. But now we have GraphQL, which basically replaces Redux in the opinion of the author, which is mm, something I don't agree with, right? So I think GraphQL is nice uh, for some use cases, once again, so I don't think it's nice for everything. I still find that majority of time I just use REST APIs. And at least, you know, for my use cases, it was easier than using GraphQL and just produced better and faster results with caching and everything. 
But in some cases, GraphQL could be very, very nice. The thing is that unless you have a very large app, like for example, Facebook, right? You don't really need a Redux. And I think that even if you try to use just GraphQL, but your app is gonna be super large, it's not gonna cut it. It's still gonna be a huge problem to manage the state over your app just by using GraphQL queries in local store. You're still gonna hit the same problems that Redux are solving. At least this is my take on it. Um, no, it's not context API this time around. I thought at first it was going to be about context API as well, but no, this time around somebody compared Redux to GraphQL. So there you go. If you're interested in, in reading more about reasoning of the author and seeing uh, why exactly he thinks that GraphQL could replace Redux, which I guess could be true for a small or medium, even maybe medium sized um, applications. Do have a look, there are some interesting points in here, but then again, you know, as I said, I don't really agree to 100% that it can completely replace Redux everywhere. That That's just not, not how it works. But anyway, it's quite interesting. So uh, do recommend to read it if you work with Redux or GraphQL or both or wanna get into them. All right, next article we got is another one from uh, Google Developer Web, uh, web de uh, Google Web Developers is what I wanna say. It's called Reduce JavaScript Payloads with Code Splitting. So I already had the uh, Reduce JavaScript Payloads with Tree Shaking from the same authors, and now we got the Reduce JavaScript Payloads with Code Splitting, a very in-depth look into what code splitting is and how to actually use it to make your uh, page lighter and to make it load faster and so on and so forth, right? So why do you need code splitting? How do you do it? Why is it important? How do you configure your Webpack? and how do you track it and so on and so forth, how the dynamic module loading works. So basically, if you are working with a very large complex apps and you wanna reduce their size, like for example, you have the React app with a lot of pages and you need to, you, you configure the router yourself and you wanna split each page to load its own uh, JavaScript dynamically, this article is for you. It will guide you through the whole process. It will explain everything you need to know it also talks uh, like this, yeah, it also links to a bunch of code splitting documentation for different projects like Parcel, React, Vue, Angular, Webpack, and um, guidance on dynamic import on Web Fundamentals, uh, the Google developers uh, website. Quite good, highly recommend it if you are interested in that kind of stuff. As I mean, as usual, you know, Google developers portal is quite amazing, to be honest. All right. Next article we got is to grok a mockingbird uh, using recursive combinators to enhance functional composition with special guests, the mockingbird, windowbird, and sagebird. Uh, sorry, widowbird, not windowbird. Um, yeah, a bit more functional programming for you here. So this is essentially a look at the recursive combinators. Um, recursive combinators is those helper functions that take another function that is not recursive and return a function that is recursive made from that function. It sounds very complicated when you read about that, but as soon as you see the source code here, you will know exactly how it works. And uh, as to why you should use that instead of just writing recursive function yourself, there is also quite a good explanation here, an example of the exponent and memoization, which is a common functional programming technique, right? Um, so if you're interested in functional programming, if you're interested in functional programming related techniques, I guess, and if you're interested in uh, memoizable, I guess, recursive functions, and specifically on the uh, recursive combinators, then do have a look at this article. There is a lot of great info here. And I think it basically teaches you uh, everything you need to know about recursive combinators and uh, why are they useful, why are they important, how to write them. Well, actually how to write them is literally like this one line of code. This is, this is, this is all it takes. It's quite, quite easy. It's just the explanation is long. You know, like, <laughs> as it, as it, it bleh, let me try that again. As it is mostly with the functional programming, you usually have like one beautiful line of code and then like two pages of explanation of how that actually works. But once you get it, it is just great. Okay, let, let, let us continue. So the next article we got is using the new Babel 7 and preset, uh, preset, yes. God, what is wrong with me today? Okay, let's try again. Using the new Babel 7 and preset TypeScript to compile Angular 6 app. So this is again, Babel 7 and uh, TypeScript 
article, but this time around specifically targeted at Angular 6 applications. So it talks about, uh, it starts with, you know, the basic usage of uh, preset TypeScript. How do you do that? Then it's very straightforward. There's a lot of tutorials about that. We already talked about one of them today. And uh, since you already set up TypeScript, the article goes, okay, so if you have TypeScript, why not use Angular already, right? Because Angular is literally built on TypeScript. So there you go. There's basically a very simple setup uh, with TypeScript and Angular and Babel uh, using uh, essentially from scratch, right? So you don't use an Angular CLI or anything like that. You do it yourself, which is, I guess, a nice way of doing it because it seems to be very straightforward to set up. So if you were interested, do check it out. This looks quite nice. I think somebody in Discord chat actually asked me about that. So maybe if you're looking, this is your answer if you still haven't found it, but you probably already did. So, you know, okay, uh, continuing. We got take the state of JavaScript 2018 survey. Uh, not really a news, but you know, there's the yearly state of JavaScript survey this, uh, that is running right now that is gives us insight into the JavaScript uh, ecosystem and developers and everything like this. So yeah, take a survey. I would suggest that you would just go through it and have a look and answer the questions. Um, the survey is not particularly well built because they have those very silly questions. Like you first you answer whether you like a technology or not like, or you never heard about it, or you want to learn it. And if you liked it, they will ask you, what do you like about it? So like, what do you like about React? And then there's like some of those answers are like, it's simple and lightweight. I know more than one library that can be just simple or just lightweight. This is, you know, this is kind of two things that you cannot bundle together. And there's like a lot of tiny things like this that are not quite good enough, at least from my opinion, to be, to be counted as an answer. But yeah, anyway, you know, if you are interested, you can take the survey, uh, you can leave them your email, you will get the results afterwards. I think we'll have a look at the results when they are out on the podcast. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be like in two in one or two weeks, more than two, probably. If you're interested, take a survey. If not, then well, what the hell? Okay, we are now the releases section. And the first major release of uh, this week was Chrome 69 with all the new fancy material UI that you can see right here. Uh, I quite like it. I know a lot of people don't like it, but I personally really like it. It basically, um, as someone noted, the main task of the browser is to disappear and get out of the way of the website, right? And I think Chrome is doing quite a good job with this. So it's like, it's getting more and more minimalistic and I'm a total fan of that. Um, additional things included, there's a CSS snap scroll, which seems to be really nice, especially for like, uh, you know, uh, swiping gestures and stuff like this, the CSS carousels. Display cutouts uh, support for people with phones with notches, which is something that I think should just go away, but probably once, but yeah. So yeah, you now have safe area thing in the browser, so you don't have to care about notches yourself, which is quite nice. Uh, we have weblocks API, which actually seems to be really interesting. So you now have the, um, a uh, specific API for locking something. So you can hold the lock that will work in all the tabs or windows or whatever opened in the same origin. So as long as lock is held in one window, all the other windows will not be able to execute the code within this lock. And once one of them is finishes, then the other will start, which sounds very interesting. Like, I don't know if I would personally have any use cases related to that, but I guess there are definitely more than one, like for example, YouTube, if you would imagine, or maybe Twitch, you know, with the whole like backgrounding and stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. Obviously there's a lot more, so do do check it out. Uh, it's also worth noting then the Chrome uh, turned 10 years. So they, the first version was released 10 years ago and I am surprised they didn't push release Chrome 70 and 10 years anniversary, but you know, we got 69, which is also fine. So it's pretty great. Congrats to the Chrome team doing awesome job. That's my favorite browser, uh, whatever anyone else says, and I'm probably will continue using it for observable future. Okay, next release we got is the August release of VS Code version 1.27, bringing us quite a lot of really cool things. First of all, we got the nice settings editor. So finally, you no longer have to edit your own um, 
you know, JSON file, which was okay, I guess, you know, since it's a developer tool. So I don't think a lot of people was against that. But now you get like a proper settings API with a search bar, which is also very nice. So uh, yeah, it's just a nice quality of life. Um, 69 smiley face. Yes, there was a lot of stupid comments to the Chrome birthday and like 69 announcement video. YouTube comments sometimes are just the worst. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so the next thing that uh, VS Code added is the custom title bar in menus on Windows and Linux for now. So the still the uh, locked on Mac OS for whatever reason, but on Windows, you can now actually theme them, which is very nice. There's also some breadcrumbs improvement, terminal menu and a bunch of other things. So if you're interested to have a look, as usual, VS Code releases are like there's a insanely large change list and uh, VS Code team just keeps killing it. And there's already update 121, uh, 127.1, which addresses some minor issues. So really awesome. All right, next release we got is Styled Components V4, which is 25% faster mounting, 7% faster updating, new global styling API, native support of the S-Prop, Full React 16 strict mode compliance, native support for ref, no more inner refs, and a lot of other stuff. And because I'm lazy, I'm not gonna read all of that stuff. So if you want, there's a link to the actual article over here to the medium. So you can go ahead and read it yourself. I just like those Twitter summaries, which was, you know, very <laughs> convenient for the podcast. Uh, you ever used HTML? If so, what source could it? Uh, yes, I have used HTML from time to time. I would highly recommend VS Code that we just talked about. So Visual Studio Code is my editor of the pick for just about any programming language, to be honest. Okay, <laughs> let's continue with the releases. Next release we got is Node.js version 10.10. The primary change being that a lot of uh, functions now accept type trace and data view values. I honestly don't know what is data view value in Node.js. This is the first time to be honest with me hearing that. So I will have to investigate that. I had no time to look into that to be honest, but um, a lot of people in Twitter, like especially in the you know low level Node community, like the low level programming, uh, like C guys and everything, the Node core team was very excited about this for some reason. So. I guess it's something important, but I probably have to read about that a bit more. <laughs> but yeah, it's quite nice to see uh, Node 10 moving forward. So yeah. Okay, uh, next release we got is React 16.5, which um, besides from all the improvements to React itself, added support for React DevTools Profiler that's been teased quite some time. So you can now can do some crazy profiling things and they promised an article soon, but uh, it wasn't unfortunately released until today. So we're probably going to talk about the profiling in the next podcast, which is something I'm quite waiting for. And um, yeah, we're going to see how that ends up because at least the early demos of the profiler was quite amazing. Okay, the next release we got is Dog Z version 0.11. This one is awesome. So they've added the React Native integration. So DocZ is this tool that uh, basically allows you to write your documentation in the uh, MDX format. So you get the markdown that allows you to write JavaScript in it, right? And it was very nice. You would write like React components. Now you can write React Native components. So you can literally create documentation for your React Native components with the React Native components rendered within the documentation. Just look at this. Just look at, and you have a playground in there. You can just try it. This is insane. This is just, how awesome is that? Just look at this. This is like, so basically if you write documentation, if you write, have a React Native project, then look no further for best docs tool ever. Um, there you go, 011. Inception, well, it's kind of, no, I mean, if you would run it on React Native, then it will be kind of Inception, yes. Like this is kind of, it's just a great tool. <laughs> Okay, let us continue. Uh, the next, oh yeah, I think that's that's it for releases. So now we are in the libraries section. And the first library we have is, uh, well, it's not exactly a library, it's a demo. It's a demo app showing integration of Guest.js and Next.js. So we talked about Guest.js quite some time ago. This is a library from uh, Google guys that allows you to do to use Google Analytics to predict where the users will click to preload that page, right? And it was, you know, it was a bit tricky to set it up and everything. So um, 
somebody was like, you know, I'll just I'll just make it for Next.js. And you're literally this is this is all setup that you need to do. It is like two lines of code and that's it. That's all you have to do. There's like two lines of code to do that and it works. And there's like a GIF demo for this here that literally shows you that when you change the page, um, the Next.js actually preloads the other page already. It is crazy that the machine learning moves so fast into the web area, you know, with TensorFlow.js and Guest.js and all that stuff. I am kind of terrified and kind of excited at the same time. <laughs> So yes, uh, if, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It seems to be extremely easy to integrate with Next.js. So yeah, quite awesome. All right, next thing we got is Grasp. Uh, it's basically grab or set for JavaScript code that works on abstract syntax tree instead of just running on text. So you can do things like you can grab a return that returns something plus something and will actually give you all the bits of code that return this stuff or you can grab for stuff or grasp i guess for stuff if tests uh or equality right and if test has end operator this looks amazing like i don't think i needed to do that uh like sort of the search my code for specific expressions that much but this looks really cool. And they recently released zero, version 0 0.4.0 with the X6 support. And it also supports refactoring commands so you can actually replace those expressions, which is even cooler. If you work a lot with the large code bases or you know grab for stuff a lot and wanna do it more uh, intelligent way, I guess, or AST aware way, do check it out. This looks really awesome. Okay, uh, next library we got is called Zoo. Uh, JavaScript library for real-time visualizations. I will show you this dashboard, which looks uh, very fancy. <laughs> so it's a basically data visualization, visualization library that supports uh, data updates and sort of real-time data, which looks really nice. So, you know, if you're looking for one of those, uh, do check it out. It seems to be quite simple uh, and it's also MIT licensed. So, you know, maybe that's what you were looking for. Okay. Next library we got is a tiny and elegant HTTP client based on the browser fetch API called Kai from, oh, I, I, I don't know, is it Kai? It's probably Kai, right? Or E Kai, I guess Kai. So it's from Mr. Sinresaurus, who is renowned for releasing billions of really good um, JavaScript modules. And it's just another one of them. Uh, it's a really nice fetch wrapper essentially uh, with uh, support for just about everything that you might ever want including cancellation. Uh, so one, one thing I learned from reading the docs for the Kai is that the fetch API cancellation through a board controller is actually shipped in all of the browsers. So yeah, uh, betting they're gonna use it in some movie. Um, you mean the grasp or what? No, this one, okay, yeah, the, the zoo, yeah. Um, maybe, it does look very movie-like. That is true. <laughs> okay, but yeah, so if you were looking for a nicer fetch API and smaller fetch API, uh, there's one kilobyte minified zipped. I mean, come on, this Syndra's horse we're talking about. This guy knows his stuff. Then uh, do have a look at this one. I should start probably because this looks absolutely awesome. Okay, uh, next thing we got is the Optigate. Um, I believe we already talked about it at some point, but this is basically a special tool to investigate V8 and Node.js function deoptimizations in your source code. So you can run it on your file and it will show you all the places where your code is actually being deoptimized by the engine so that you can actually optimize it or you know fix it so it does not get deoptimized. It is a really cool tool for, I mean, not just the optimizations, optimizations and like caching as well. So basically it will show you everything that engine does to your source code. This still works amazingly well for the code optimizations. And um, maybe this is one of the reasons that I never needed to do those super low level, you know, like the bitwise operators and everything. Because this was usually enough for me to fix all of my performance issues. So yes, highly recommend it if you haven't heard about it yet. Okay, uh, next thing we got is Microjob, a tiny wrapper for turning Node.js worker threads into easy to use routines for heavy CPU loads. So we already talked about 
not just worker threads. I even did a stream on that and we built a nice uh, factorial that used worker threads. Uh, but you know, they are a bit of a pain in the ass to use, to be honest, right? So you have to like create a new file and you have to spawn it and you have to wait for it, communicate with it. So it's, it's a bit of a hassle, right? So the author was like, okay, so let's make it simpler. So you literally have this job abstraction you can pass a function to it and return from that function and then you can just await the uh, job wrapper and that's it. Works quite well. Um, there is some problems. So there is, I don't really see any uh, way to, so you can pass the data, but it seems like it's gonna be like the, um, Okay, you got the context. Okay, basically there's some minor issues around it, which you have to be aware of, but you know, again, worker threads, node threads are still experimental and this library is basically also experimental. So pretty excited to see where, how it develops and where it goes, but it looks really good. Uh, okay, continuing, we got Scorn, I guess. Scorn, Scorn, a JavaScript library for building SQL queries. Um, it's yeah, another JavaScript query library that works for any SQL database. In this example, they show the example with Postgres. Um, I am not sure if I'm a huge fan of using template literals for some things because it just looks weird to me at least. Um, so there's like, you can initialize the models using this SQ template literal and then you can use template literal for those modules. Uh, so those modules become a template literal, but as well a class that you can use to either query through the function invocation or through the template, which I guess would be the um, query itself, which just feels so weird to even look at it. Like I, I, I don't know. It also is very strange to see that he escaped use the template literal to write 13 here. <laughs> it just seems so weird. But yeah, you know, maybe this is the thing that you were looking for. Maybe, maybe that's what you wanted. Do have a look. It looks a bit strange to my liking with all this template literals and then function invocation following them. But uh, and maybe, maybe you're fine with that. Maybe you like it. Just have a look. Okay, next library we got is date funds, a modern JavaScript date utility library. So if you're still using moment.js, switch to this one. This is like 10 times smaller, 10 times simpler and quite a lot faster. Basically includes all the same features. And uh, yeah, will save you a lot of kilobytes essentially. Um, and my JavaScript is blocked, so it just does more. There we go, um, now it should work. There we go, okay, yeah. So as you can see here, it's quite feature rich, has a lot of uh, stuff that you want. So, and it also supports um, tree shaking and you can make it even smaller. If I remember correctly, I think I think it did support tree shaking. Um, was it? I think it did, at least. This, this is what I remember. Yeah, okay. So you got the even ESM modules is built in a very similar format to Lodash. So you can just reshake whatever you want, which is very nice. So, you know, if you're working with dates and don't want to drag the whole moment JS, which is quite big, uh, do check this one out. It is quite good. Okay, next thing we got is Docker Compose Command Center. This is a blessed UI command line tool for Docker Compose output that seems to be actually quite nifty. So instead of you know, getting your Docker Compose output all in line, which can be a bit of a pain in the ass to read, you get it in a nice sort of window format uh, where you can actually click on things to, or click on containers, I guess, to actually get the logs of them displayed in a nice uh, sub window. So if you're working a lot with a Docker Compose, do check it out, this looks pretty nifty. Okay, next thing we got is inspector on demand, V8 inspector dev tools on demand for long running apps. So I think this is one of my, uh, this addresses one of my most common uh, annoyances with um, long, like debugging long running apps in Node.js is that normally if you activate and do debug and uh, then you do something, it will no longer, like there will be some problems afterwards, right? So. Um, this thing, like this library actually addresses this and does the, uh, allows you to tap into your long running process at any moment and do like 
breakpoints and whatever the hell you want, pause the execution and basically what, whatever you would normally do while debugging with uh, literally one simple require. That seems to be quite nice. The only requirement is that it needs Node v uh, version 8 or higher. I'm guessing it uses the uh, instrumentation hooks to do that. But yeah, it looks pretty nifty. So if you're no, you know, if you're uh, debugging long running apps a lot, do check it out. It is quite nice. Okay, next thing we got is Notebook, minimalistic node wrapper with web UI. Okay, let me be honest with you. I had a idea of project called Notebook for quite some time, and somebody just stolen the name from me. So I'm a bit disappointed in myself for not making it faster, but. What can I do? There you go. So it's a node REPL that you can run in your browser. Um, it basically allows you to run anything you want in the backend in the Node.js and save it as well for the later execution. Seems to be pretty nice. The only problem is that there's no security, no user management or anything. So the author recommends running it on 127 set on basically localhost only. So do not bind it to the global address. Or if you expose it, add some password and authentication yourself, basically, right? Because whoever can execute code in this will be able to run anything in your Node.js so that he can screw it up quite a lot. Um, it's actually been a project that I wanted to build for a long time. So we have this observable uh, HQ, right? So there's observable HQ com. That is really cool. So you have all those really cool visualizations and you can write this, you know, you can write this really cool code and you can, you know, check the whole code itself you can navigate it and all of that works in the browser. So the thing is that all of those bits of code, they are just working in the browser, but from time to time you want to do the same, but with a Node.js and backend. So I, my idea was to build a notebook which would allow you to do kind of like combine observable with a node backend, right? So it allow you to do like one, I guess I would call it the sort of like the Python, um, what is it, IPython, right? I think it was IPython. Uh, yes, Jup Jupyter, that's what the name of it. So you got the Jupyter things, which is a really popular in uh, data science community way of dealing with data and I know you can have the Jupyter Node.js core and you can just use it, but it was always a bit of a, not quite what I wanted basically. So, but yeah, you know what? Maybe at some point I will build a project like this. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. It was an idea of mine for a long time. But okay, let's continue with the projects. Okay, so we got the next uh, project library demo that is called Baker. It's quick and easy baking of computing environments. Essentially, it's a simple tool for provisioning virtual machines and containers. Seems to be um, sort of alternative to, oh my God, what's the name of it? Uh, Vagrant, well, well, that's what I want to say. So it's basically like Vagrant, but it, but it works not just with virtual machines. It also works with like different backends, including um, DigitalOcean, Docker, whatever you can imagine. It looks nice. I mean, I still think I would just go for uh, Exaframe that I built because, you know, I purely use Docker like 99% of the time. So I don't really care about VMs and stuff like this, but maybe if you work with Vagrant and Zibble and stuff like this, and you needed to abstract all of that into one tool, maybe this is for you to do check it out. It seems to be, seems to be quite interesting at least. Okay, uh, and the last uh, demo we have for today or library is an express monitor, configurable express decorator to automate log and metrics, um, exactly what, ex what you would expect. It basically provides the metrics and logging that is auto set up for your ExpressJS app. Um, there is, yeah, so you can use either just logging or just metrics if you want to. It is from the Financial Times uh, developers. So, you know, it seems to be pretty interesting. Uh, if that sounds interesting for you, do check it out. It seems to be quite nice. Right, that's it for the demos. Now we come to our uh, interesting and silly stuff section. Uh, the first thing I wanted to highlight, there is this two threads on Twitter. So there's actually two threads. First one is, uh, Men in tech, uh, my DMs are open if you're willing to share your salary anonymously to help your female peers. 
essentially the thread started as a sort of international women's day salary sharing to you know help women figure out if they're being underpaid there's a bunch of uh like quite a lot actually like almost 200 salaries with uh, sort of the role position location salary bonuses whatever you can imagine U.S. being insane on the salaries as it usually is, especially the Bay Area, it's like 300,000 for the software engineer. Like, why would you need so much money? But I guess, you know, with the housing prices in Bay Area, you probably need like half of that just for your flat. So not really complaining and living in Germany. <laughs> but yeah, this is really interesting. And then there's a second thread that actually asked not men. So, you know, whoever is not men basically, send their salaries and location and everything uh, to, again, the author. There's unfortunately way less answers in this thread. But uh, what I think is interesting is it doesn't seem like there is such a huge difference. So again, you know, to properly compare that, you would need to actually scrape this data, build it into data sets and then do a proper comparison, which would actually be an interesting tiny project for someone. But uh, yeah, this just thought it would be interesting for you guys to check it out and see, you know, how it compares to your salary. Like, good God, thanks. Thank God I'm not in San Francisco. It's like when you think they get so much money, but then they spend half of that on the housing It's just like, no, man, I, I don't know. This is just terrifying. But yeah, it's uh, just a quite interesting insight. Okay, the next thing we got is the... A bit of a gaming news, I guess. So I don't know if uh, most of you guys saw me play Exapunks new Zactronic games that uh, task you with hacking things. And uh, well, as, as it tends to happen with uh, Zactronics, they put um, fictional Game Boy in it that you can program. And uh, yeah, somebody programmed that Game Boy to play Asteroids and Pong. So you can actually, so there's like, okay, there's the, there you go. So there's, you can actually, let me just mute that. There is an actual, Pong programmed on in-game in Virtual Game Boy. I don't even want to know how they did that. I don't even want to know how the code looks because it's basically assembly and <laughs> this is, to be honest, insane. But that's the thing. And uh, yeah, there's not just Pong. There's also like space type destroyer. They, just look at this. This is insane. On the other hand, someone like, I, I don't remember if I highlighted here or not, but someone did build a um, Lisp to Zactronic assembly compiler at some point, which is even crazier. But um, yeah, so, you know, Zactronic games are quite amazing. If you never play them, do try it out. They are really cool and really fun. Okay. Next thing we got is, yeah, a bit of information from someone who decided to inspect Slack page for whatever reason. Slack transfers 5.5 megabytes of assets to show your login form and jumps to nine megabytes once you sign in. Slack, why are you doing this? And this is actually minified and gzipped data. Can you imagine how much stuff do they have in there? Five megabytes just for a login form. Why, what are you doing there? Uh, <laughs> and of course the, yes, the, Jokes about tree shaking and all that kind of stuff in the comments. This is always quite hilarious, but uh, yeah, please don't do this. Like if, if you're working in Slack, please fix this. <laughs> it's there. I think maybe that explains why their desktop app is so terrible. I'm guessing it also has like 200 megabytes of JavaScript just to render the Electron app, which is which would explain why it's so slow while VS Code is so fast. Not a fan of Slack as you might imagine, but yeah, okay. Uh, last silly thing we have for today is this new bug or I guess feature in the Chrome, uh, the latest Chrome added um, a thing they call trivial subdomains, which is basically anything that starts with dub, dub, dub or www, right? It's going to be stripped. And uh, even if you are on, I don't know, like Google's probably redirects to the non, no, it doesn't. Yeah, so if, if you click on the um, on the page, you just see google.com, right? If you if you actually enter the address bar, we actually see that we are on, on uh, www.google.com. So Google decided, okay, these domains are trivial, so we're gonna strip them. 
and it sounds like an okay-ish idea until you start seeing the problems with it. So first of all, they are stripping this, uh, they're stripping not just www, they're also stripping stuff like .m .domain, right? But the problem is not that. The problem is they're stripping it from any part of subdomain. So if you type subdomain.www.domain.com, it will display a subdomain.domain.com, which is just straight up wrong. <laughs> And um, that's not the only example. There is like, it's, I, I don't know who thought it was a good idea, but it backfired spectacularly. So yeah, this, this thread is quite amusing to read and quite a good reminder that uh, it's never a good idea to try to be smart with standards when they specifically define that, hey, you know, uh, this is how it should work. Do not mess with it. So um, yeah, if you type www.m.www.m.example.com, you will just see example.com, which is ridiculous. And uh, aside from the problem with, you know, figuring out where you are, that also brings another problem of, you know, scamming. Because if you, if you, I don't know, can you actually make a, so imagine if you make a domain that would be like, www.com, right? Or m.com or whatever. And then we have paypal.m.com. So I, I, here's a, wait a second. I don't know if it will resolve paypal.m.com. So this won't be reached, right? But um, just bear with me. I want to, you know what? I want to just see if that will work. I have a crazy idea. Um, so we are going to do something stupid. We are going to see if we can scam ourselves, I guess. Um, Open, let me just, I guess, a uh, terminal that so we can pro uh, project. Yes, may, uh, ESL, let me just dock it here so I can see the chat. So here's the thing, here's the question. If I, if I make dear PayPal M tests, let's just call it this way. Let me just really quickly, um, yeah, just you need it with whatever. Come on, I don't care. npm add express. So we're just gonna have a simple express app here. This we don't even need to do express app, right? We can just stop, 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 stop. Um, I have the simple server thing, right? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so we have a port eighty eighty. So theoretically, if we go to localhost eighty eighty. We should be able to see our. Okay, cool. So now if we go, if we edit our hosts file, right? So this is what we want hosts. No, okay, no file, open file. So we want our Windows host file, I think it's like Windows. Was it system 32 or something? Uh, drivers or whatever, man, the Windows host file location is confusing as hell usually. Yeah, the file. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So again, uh, resolve our local host to um, this file, this domain, and check. Uh, yes, retry as admin. Thank you very much. Oh, well, no. Yeah, I clicked the wrong thing. There you go. Save it. Okay. So in theory, whoops, that is not what I want to press. Uh, what connection? Ref oh, because we're running on port 8080, right? This is what I want to do. Uh, yes, simple server. Okay, so we're gonna run this at port 80, sudo, okay, yes. So theoretically, I know it actually, okay, so if it's a top level domain, it actually doesn't, doesn't screw it up, but it does remove the first one. Okay, so at least it doesn't remove it at the top level. <laughs> so it's not completely terrible. All right, all right, well, okay. <laughs> You know, that's, that's fine, that's fine. I probably should have removed that domain from ADC host, but whatever. Okay, um, yeah, so it's it's a bit silly and there's a lot of discussions in here. So if it sounds interesting, there are some interesting thoughts in here. So I, you know, I would recommend looking into it at least a bit because it is quite, at least entertaining. Okay, um, that's actually it from my side. That's all I got for today. Uh, so if you guys have anything else you want to ask, or maybe I missed something, or maybe you just want to 
Ask my opinion about something, talk about something, throw it into the chat right now. If not, then we can uh, wrap the stream up and go have an awesome rest of the Saturday or I don't know, maybe it's already Sunday at your place or rest of the weekend. Let's just put it this way. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, um, so I guess no questions. I'm gonna wait for one more minute. And if there is no questions, we can just uh, call it a day. Let me open my remote control. All right, well, no questions then. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. If you built something and wanna share it, do send it over to me. If you just wanna ask some questions, do join us at our Discord server or throw them in or, you know, throw the Twitter or whatever. Um, wait a sec, okay, I'm waiting. <laughs> I, come on, you waited for me to go halfway through my goodbye phrase. I was like, wait a second, <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you for your, thank you. That is really, really uh, cool to hear. Like it's, it's really, it's always awesome to know that there are people who appreciate what I do. It's like, it's, it's, it's what basically keeps me pushing. Okay, so I'm waiting a second. Come on, where's, where's your stuff? Where's your stuff? Just ask away already. <laughs> I mean, no worries, but you know, it was like, I gave a good minute for everyone to think if they want to ask me something and I started saying goodbye and you're like, just wait a minute. And it's like, no. Okay. But yes, come on, I'm waiting. Shoot, ask away. Meanwhile, I, I still should reorganize the episodes because this sorting is not good. And I, I mean, I should also add links to the route probably. Oh man, so much organizational things to do with the podcast and I'm just too lazy for that. Oh God. Uh, meanwhile, my, while we're waiting for your question, um, I'm just gonna remind everyone that on Wednesday, we're gonna be doing uh, coding proposals. So we have this proposals repository where you can submit your own proposal and then you can go into proposal and use gestures to vote for proposals. And every Tuesday I pick the one, uh, the top one, most voted one. And on Wednesday, I'm gonna build it live. React UI Library China. Okay, I don't know what is that. React UI Library China. Uh, and design, you mean this one? Is this is the one you mean? They still have the same problem for me. It is <laughs> it renders at like five frames per second. Can you go deeper? Um, I mean, you know, last time I saw that, I saw this bit and I was like, I mean, okay, maybe that works for someone, but that just <laughs> looks terrible. I, like how, why is it so slow? I, like, look at this, look at this frame rates. What are they doing in there? Are they like mining Bitcoin in the background? What is happening? Okay, you know what? I'm curious. I'm gonna fire up the task manager. I'm gonna put it over here over the chat and I'm gonna refresh it again. We're gonna see the CPU load. 26, 65, what, what is, it's JavaScript. What is it doing there? Why is it even 30? <laughs> you know what? I mean, it might be a good library, but I'm not gonna use it. <laughs> not with a performance like this. Uh, there is UmiJS like, Umi, I think I've heard about it at some point. Pluggable enterprise level React application framework. Okay, that sounds fancy. Uh, from and design team. Okay, I don't know if I wanna to touch that. <laughs> um, so here's the thing, right? I don't mind having more frameworks. I like good frameworks. I like trying out new frameworks, but as soon as your frameworks starts loading my CPU to 50%, when I reload the page, I'm gonna close the page. And it doesn't matter how good it is, I'm gonna close the page anyway. Uh, that seems to be okay-ish, I guess. Get started. Okay, I mean, okay, at least this one doesn't load your page up to 50% of the CPU. But I mean, I don't know, like, you know, I'm happy with Next.js, so I 
with stuff like this, if they say like, hey, we are like Next.js, but better, then I want to see a comparison. So where is, what is the difference with the Next.js and why should I use UmiJS instead of Next.js? Like, I don't really see it immediately. So advanced, why not uh, Next.js? Yes, the rooting of Next.js is relatively simple. Okay, so they basically their only advantage over Next.js is rooting. Uh, okay, but Next.js advanced rooting is coming in the next version. So once again, I don't really see a reason. You know, it's like, okay, I guess it's fine. Uh, did I just close something? I guess I closed my BXJS. But okay, let's let's just have a look at the really nice cyberpunk thing. Okay, any other questions or should, should we wrap it up here or should I just start talking and then you'll just cut me in the middle again? <laughs> I'm gonna wait for a second here. Go ahead, collect your, gather your thoughts, ask your question if you need to. <laughs> Okay, that doesn't seem like you have any more questions. All right, guys. Um, let's just wrap it up here. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support, for your kind words and all your questions as well. Um, have an awesome rest of the weekend. Once again, as I said, join our Discord server. Throw me your questions at Twitter, GitHub, uh, Twitch, YouTube, whatever the hell you want. If you missed anything of this, the podcast will be on YouTube and CastBox uh, and all the links are on GitHub as usual. So you can find all of that stuff in a Twitch description channel. Uh, no, Twitch channel description is what I want to say. <laughs> Once again, thank you for watching and I see you on Wednesday for our programming live stream. Have an awesome, uh, have an awesome rest of the weekend and bye-bye. <laughs>